China Mieville has written nine novels, three novellas, three short story collections, and more, including a nonfiction work called Red Planets, Marxism and Science Fiction. As that title suggests, he's also a social activist and even ran for a seat in the House of Commons for, a so for the Socialist Alliance in 2001. So he's particularly well positioned to bring a novelist's dynamism and a radical's perceptiveness to the world of the Russian Revolution, the topic of his new nonfiction book, October. This narrative, too, is urgent and strange, as he says in a recent interview. We need its memory in these bleak, sadistic times. And so we do. China, Yeovil. So uh, in your introduction to October, you described the events between February and October as a, quote, continuous jostling process, a torquing of history. Um, it's apt that your note on the Julian and Gregorian calendar says that for the student of the Russian Revolution, time is literally out of joint. In Baslog, there's a, the world of Perdido Street Station. Um, Baslog's experienced a catastrophic, magical, natural disaster called the Torque. So could you talk for a minute about this image of torquing, torquing, not torquing, torquing, turning, um, and think about whether there's some sort of connection between this torque that creates an environmental, environmental magical wasteland and sort of the torquing of history um, that you're writing about here. To answer the second question first, I mean, I'm sure there is a connection, but I'm quite loath to, um, to, to, try, to, um, to try to investigate it too, too closely um, because I think there's a, there's, a, there's a danger of kind of glib analogizing, you know. And, and when, I, when I was writing the, the, the Russia book, it was very important to me that, um, you know, this was a, although it is not, it's not an academic book and I made, the, with my editor, I made the decision like not to use footnotes and so on, but it is because it, it's intended to be introductory and, um, you know, for the kind of general reader, but it is exhaustively researched and so on and it's quite sort of, uh, you know, it's, it's as rigorous as I could possibly be about the history. So, for me, I, I am going to duck that question, not because not because there's no connection between the fiction and the non-fiction, there clearly is, because I have, you know, one head and different spoons with which I spoon things out of it. You know, there's the fiction spoon and the non-fiction spoon. So I, that's absolutely true. But I think, I think it would be tendentious and, uh, and unconvincing for me to start sort of saying, you know, in, well, in a way, dot, dot, dot. You know, like, I think, that's, I, think, I think that kind of connection is for other people to... Um, to, to, to sort of sift through and, and, and figure out. And then I can, be, I can be very interested in that, but I'm probably the, the worst person to actually ch sort of think, think about it prima facie, you know? Yeah. In terms of the, the specifics of the Russian Revolution being time out of joint, I mean, that's true in, in many respects. I mean, um, the whole of that year, the year of 1917 is a very strange year in Russia because you have a revolution occurs at the beginning of the year in February, which nobody predicts. Everyone predicts that something is gonna happen. Like people are saying in, in, at the end of 1916 and so on, they're saying the si system has to change. There's no way it can continue because the Tsar is you know, sclerotic and appalling and um, you know, the system is crumbling and the war is destroying you know, what, what, what shell of legitimacy it had. Um, but scant days before the revolution of February 1917, like full-time hardened activists are saying to each other, well, you know, nothing much is happening. There's not going to be any, you know, unfortunately, we're in for the long haul on this one. And then days later, this conflagration erupts on International Women's Day, led by women. Um, and then you have this kind of very, very strange situation for between February and October um, of what is called the dual power between a kind of very, between the Soviet sort of council of workers and peasants and soldiers representatives and the liberal government. And the point being that that entire year, there's a kind of oscillation of two different kinds of time, two different kinds of speed, two different sets of urgencies and priorities and so on. So that is a metaphor to which I return a lot. But the thing about metaphors is they're not just like filigrees or like kind of glosses on top of reality. I think at their best they can also be uh, useful kind of moments of illumination. 
Hence the repeated references to trains and wires and things like that as well. I am going to ask you about trains in a minute for sure. Um, so you also write a little bit about multicultural Russia, and so your yeah. comment just now about the Women's Day is interesting. In the book you write um, sort of the, quote, the boisterousness and experiment thrown up by February went on, developing into particular shapes, channeling into more serious formal investigations of liberation in the nations and minorities, unrest stirred and moves for autonomy. So this leads in the book to, uh, in the book also in history, um, to an all Russian Muslim conference in Moscow mm -hmm. that adopts among other principles, women's suffrage, sex equality, and quote, the non compulsory nature of the hijab. So can you contrast that 1917 tremulous times Russia, um, particularly with this notion of you know, women and Islam, um, with today's sort of authoritarian, nationalistic, white nationalist Russia? Um, well, that's a huge question. I mean, let me just say first about the, um, the, 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 the uh, other nations, the oppressed nations, because many, most, many, mo many stroke most were oppressed under Tsarism. I mean, one of the the remits for the for the book um, in telling the story was an attempt to kind of constantly remind readers, particularly the new reader, that this was a uh, um, a multi-ethnic kind of international uh, international within the kind of Russian Empire and aspirationally at least beyond um, endeavor. And because of the way history happened, it the the kind of pull of the narrative constantly returns to St. Petersburg, um, the capital. Um, but there are also these transmission belts of radicalism and up, up, you know insurgency and, and chaos and uh, renewal, the train lines and the wires. And, and not only that, but of course, the, 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 there's also ideas coming back in the other way. So the book kind of, I, I constantly try to kind of uh, almost like fractal out to mention and draw attention to the fact that there's also things happening like um, incredible political things happening uh, in, in Baku, in Azerbaijan, in Latvia, in Riga, in, you know, wherever, across this enormous territory. Um, and, and that's having a kind of bleed through effect as well the other way. In terms of um, the question of Russia today, um, I mean, the fundamental, I mean, you know, the, the, the prime purpose of this particular book for, for the bulk of its length is to tell the story as a kind of narrative history. But that doesn't mean disavowing a kind of political or analytical lens. And particularly in the last chapter in the epilogue, I, I kind of go into these questions a bit. Um, and for me, I mean, basically there's, there's, there's one, there's a fundamental question when you talk about the relationship of 1917, of October, to Russia today, or indeed Russia in 19... If Russia today or Russia pre-1989, Russia in 1956, Russia in 1942, whatever. And that is whether you see this as fundamentally continuity or rupture. The, the Russian, you know, the communist government, uh, you know, insisted it was continuity. The right wing internationally insisted it was continuity and that's why you don't want it because you don't want to live in Stalin's Russia. And there's always been a dissenting tradition that suggests and insists and puts forward an analysis saying that what happened in Russia uh, quite early on, and you can argue about the dates, but certainly from the late 20s onwards, was a rupture, was a break, was indeed a betrayal of what happened before in all its failings and, and, and problems. And so, to a certain extent, you know, what's the, um, you know, what's the nature of Russia today as related to this kind of carnival-esque of, uh, of, of, of creativity and, and, and uh, investigation? It is the culmination of a decades-long process of betrayal. The interesting thing after 1989 is that, you know, of course, the, the Russian state subsequent to, to, to that um, has not even kind of paid lip service to the, the, you know, to, to the events of 1917, indeed is very embarrassed of it. So at the moment, which leads to all kinds of weird, um, weird phenomena. So for example, at the moment, you have this, this, this very peculiar thing in Russia where Putin is, uh, hates Lenin, hates the early Bolsheviks. Um, there is gonna be, you know, no official recognition of 1917. Um, it, it, it's really not something that they want to talk about, primarily because Lenin was not a Russian nationalist, quite the opposite. Whereas, of course, within, within Putin's own circle, there's a great deal of nostalgia for Stalin, because he was a, 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 a Russian chauvinist, you know, though not 
originally ethnically Russian, but nonetheless, he was, you know, this incredible kind of great Russian nostalgia. Um, and then that's combined sometimes explicitly with some of the kind of very peculiar political formulations in Russia, like kind of national Bolshevism and stuff. Um, and then, and then that, that combines often within the same kind of groups of people with this incredible nostalgia for the Tsars. So you're going to see nothing about 1917 put forward officially by the Russian government this year. You know, the centenary of, I think, the most epochal event of the 20th century and beyond. Next year, when you get to the, the anniversary of, of, the, um, of the killing of the Romanovs, it's going to be a carnival of reaction. It's going to be endless blathering. You're not going to hear the end of it. That's very fascinating. So I, I was really... Um struck by the way you feature Stalin and Lenin, you know, sort of the most familiar characters in the story. Um, you know, you feature them sort of um, not just in terms of what we know they're going to become, but you try to sort of see them as who they are in the moment, and it's really deft and pretty chilling. So about Stalin, you write, um, you know, the book um, lets us know that any, any version of Stalin we're writing about is haunted by this, quote, haunted by a ghost from the future, uh, that twinkly-eyed, mustachioed monstrosity, Uncle Joe, the butcher, the ism that bears his name. Um, I, th I, th I really enjoyed that, sort of the way you place them in yeah. the ghosts of history and also in the present moment. There are so many people, characters, personages, really, in this book, um, and there's a reader's aid glossary for them. Um, some of your novels, I think, have many more characters and much more complex geography and usually don't have a glossary of characters. Um, <laughs> So I'm wondering if you would talk a little bit about whose story you really wanted yeah. us to pay attention to here. You say that you have heroes and villains. Like, who are the heroes and villains yeah. you want to point to? I sh I went, something about the glossary of characters. Um, one of the things that happens, you know, when you, you publish a book is inevitably glitches creep in, inevitably. And um, so you, you try to kind of make notes of a few errata and so on to fix. Um, and... So far, nothing too awful. I'm, you know, it's going well. But there is one that that glossary of characters. Uh, you know, I tried to kind of take in everyone in the book, and there's like a sort of two or three lines about their life and so on. So that if you're going through the book and you you need to check who somebody is, there is one omission, uh, one person that completely slipped my mind to include, and slipped the mind of my editor, the copy editors, everyone at Verso, the publisher, and that's Stalin, um, <laughs> and. I, this was pointed out in an otherwise reasonably positive review in a, in a, in a, a, a socialist newspaper in, in Britain that has a kind of, uh, I don't want to be unfair, it has perhaps more of a, a, a nostalgic view of certain aspects of the Stalinist project than many of the rest of us on the left. And um, so, it, you know, this, this to me is very clearly a kind of, you know, deeply Freudian yearning miss, you know, a mission in me. It's the most kind of camp, overdetermined gap in history. Uh, um, so, yes. Um, what was the question? Sorry. Um, <laughs> Just to talk about, um, so, you know, who do you think the heroes oh, yeah. and villains are of, the, of October, and who do you want us to look yeah. at the most? Well, it was... One of the, to try to tell the story as a, as a story, you know, I'm constantly thinking, like, don't take anything for granted. Don't, don't take a reader in mind who knows anything about this. This is part of the, the aim for this. And, the, and, and, and trying to tell it. Uh, it's not a phrase I like very much, but it's one that my editor used, and so I feel I'm allowed that, you know, he said that we, we want this told novelistically. Like, this is to be, you know, using the fact of that I come mostly from fiction. Um, and one of the ways that, but, but within that, I wanted to be as rigorous as possible, as I say. So there are certain rules that I set myself. So, for example, there's no quotes, there's no descriptions of any events or any people or spoken word that is not reported in the, in the scholarly or historical literature. That's all there. Nothing of that is invented. One of the ways that it would have been kind of, I suppose, easier in certain respects to tell it as a narrative would have been to pick an individual character, person, I mean, a real person, and to kind of focus on them, so to sort of tell it through their story. And I auditioned that idea briefly, um, but I decided not to precisely because I, partly because I wanted a more synoptic view, I wanted to be able to kind of go all over the place. Um, and also because, uh, yeah, and because they weren't all, you know, they weren't all there at the time. Um, which means that inevitably there is sort of snapshots of, lot, as you say, lots of different people, many of whom I, w I wish 
I could have written more about. You know, the book is, it's not crazy long, but it's already like, I, I want it to be something that you, you, you can pick up and, and read sort of in, in one or two sittings, you know what I mean? So the first draft was much longer, and, and I, there are various people I would have liked to talk about a lot more. Maria Spiridonova, the great uh, revolutionary leader of, not the Bolsheviks, the, the left socialist revolutionary party, a, a kind of very odd pro-peasant party. This remarkable figure, uh, incredibly famous at the time, not nearly talked about enough now, um, spent 10 years in prison um, for shooting a, um, a, a representative of the Tsarist regime before the revolution. In the aftermath of, um, uh, you know, was, was assaulted, um, probably raped, certainly sexually assaulted in prison, became kind of a cause celebre. In the aftermath of February, uh, was it promptly, you know, set free, immediately voted in as mayor of the town where she was in prison, first order as mayor, blow up the prison. <laughs> that is gangster. Um, so you've got people like Maria Spiridonova, and, and she's in there, and I tried to write about her as much as I could, but um, it, there's a lot to tell. So I would have liked to do more about her. Um, I, I would have liked to do Kerensky himself, who is the you know the the, the leader for a lot of the time of the of the of the liberal provisional government. Um, someone for whom I have absolutely no political sympathy at all, uh, and who is the most extraordinary figure. But I could not shake a kind of what I what I think of as a kind of narrative affection because he's such an extraordinary figure. And every time he comes on the stage, he, these things keep happening where if I were to write this as fiction, my editor would say, you've got to dial that down, it's too much, no one's going to buy that, you know. Um, so, you know, he uncovers a great plot against himself and he spends the night singing operatic arias into the, into the small hours, keeping his prisoner awake in the room next to him and all this stuff. I mean, he's, he's just, you could not make him up. So... I'm veering from your question. Politically, the, there, are, there are obviously people who, you know, who are these amazing figures like Lenin and Trotsky and Spiridonova and, and uh, Lunacharsky and Kollontai and various others. Um, didn't want to get into hagiography, didn't want to get into, I mean, you know, all of them perfectly capable of mistakes and foolishnesses and, and so on and wanted to be very clear about that. Um, but then there's also just these figures that are just amazing narratively. Kornilov himself, the great hard right general who has this kind of uh, attempted, uh, very confusing attempted conspiracy against the government, is an amazing figure. You could write all kinds of stories about Kornilov, this kind of brutal, um, dashing reactionary. Some of the some of the kind of super hard right, um, Perishkovich, who you know this. Uh, 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 sort of maddened, eccentric, fascist, like awful, desperate, hideous people, but colourful and fascinating. So there was a kind of draw, not in terms of heroes and villains, that's a more clear-cut category, but a kind of narrative draw that crossed beyond political sympathies and solidarities. Interesting. I, um, as you said before, you know, this the book continually returns to St. Petersburg. And I, yeah. I think, you know, you tease very novelistically at the very beginning with this, you literalizing the apocryphal story of Peter the Great sort of standing in the swamp saying, here comes everything. And then, you know, saying like, just kidding, fans of my novels, this is not how this book's gonna go. This didn't really happen. Um, so I'm, uh, there's another moment where um, Lenin, who's incognito, meets up with a cursing Cossack, mm. um, demanding shelter from the rain. Um, and then Lenin sort of reluctantly lets him in his hut, and he says, "Like I'm here to kill Lenin. Have you seen him?" Um, so yeah, again, too much. <coughs> dial down. Couldn't happen. No one's going to buy it. Right. You know. So you know, thinking about what you were just saying about writing history here, um, you know, you call this an alarming incident. Uh, Lenin sort of thinks of it as an alarming incident. Um, I was really interested interested in that uh, phrasing, alarming incident, and I yeah. wondered if that came from the primary or secondary source you used, and if in this example or in other examples, if you talk about moving from primary, secondary stuff to yeah. really tight dramatization, like yeah. in that scene. Well, for the, I mean, I don't read Russian. I don't, I'm not a historian. I don't pretend to be. So this is not, you know, this, this is not adding to the sum of research. What this is, as I, as, I, as I say, is a narrative retelling based on a very extensive program of research on the voluminous... Um, uh, secondary literature and English language literature, and also the, the memoirs of people who were there at the time, either translated or who were writing in English. Um, 
any, as I say, anything in quotes, in quotation marks, was either said or at the very least was reported to have been said in the formulation that I used. Um, so all of all of the, that exchange comes directly from you know the the the, the write up of it afterwards and so on. Um, whether or not, I can't honestly remember off the top of my head whether it was me or Lenin who called it an alarming <laughs> incident. Um, but he had, I mean, some 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 of the some, sometimes there are these rather rather interesting formulations that I think are kind of artifacts of translation. So word choices that. <clears throat> are not probably the word that's the go-to for, for a native speaker, but that that's how these things have come to be translated. Parenthetically, one of the interesting things about being around the far left is there, are, there is a lot of um, I, what I think of as excessively uncritical kind of, what I kind of think of as a kind of cosplay politics where you essentially kind of dress up as Lenin and try to do Lenin again and again, you know. And one of the, one of the ways you can tell, for, for, from my perspective, uh, a politics which is colored by this um, unconvincing approach is that their pamphlets often read like these translated pamphlets from 100 years ago. Like they have these really eccentric cadences because there's this kind of unconscious mimicking of of the versions that they read in the, you know, from kind of um, progress publishing from Moscow from the 50s or whatever. Um, so that particular formulation, I honestly can't remember. If it's in quotation marks, it was Lenin. Um, I don't, it, it is on my sheet, but I don't think it was in the book, so we'll see. Um, I, it's interesting, I would have assumed that you read Russian actually reading this book, and I was gonna ask you about like that sort yeah. of language knowledge and translation. No, I don't, I mean, I, I was very, I, I I wanted the book to be something that would not embarrass itself in front of the specialists. So I had I, I had a lot of specialist scholars were extremely generous and read through the um, the manuscript and helped me with um, you know chasing sources and pointing me at you know unusual references and so on and so forth. Um, but part of the kind of wager of the book was. Uh, th there's the obvious wager, which is that you know the telling of a narrative history by by someone who's better known as a as a novelist. That there's a there's an advantage to that. There's a, there's a there there. But the second one, for me at least, one of the ways I could kind of go into this was to sort of think, as someone who went into this process with a sort of you know okay but pretty you know passing knowledge of the specifics of that year, and then who went through this you know very intensive two year process of of learning. The hope was that part of that, the sense of the urgency of that learning itself and the sense of the kind of pace of that um, would communicate itself through the writing so that there was, there was an attempt, at least in my head, to kind of make a virtue of the fact that I'm not a specialist, I don't pretend to be, that this was an uncovering of a, of a discovery for me in, in many of these specifics. Um, as an aside, one of the things that one of the advantages I had, which is that because it's a narrative history, I can be a bit more, uh, in certain places, a bit more gossipy. Um, I mean, not you know, I've got to tell the main story, but I have room for a few more kind of asides and um, investigations and so on. And also, I think one of the things that you notice when you read a lot of the histories, and I'm talking about brilliant, amazing, fantastic books that you know I, that I, I kind of stare down from on the shoulders of but they are specialist books so they're often quite daunting they're often very thick they're often you know forests of footnotes and one of the things that's interesting about them is if you're reading these books that are by um, historians who may have been working on this topic for you know 30 years or whatever occasionally you get a sense that they have they've forgotten what is amazing so you get these references in passing that are just so extraordinary, and and that I would like have a little bit of a time to kind of be able to go back and 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 and, uh, and investigate and maybe talk about a little bit more. And the one that sort of sticks in my mind—it's a bad example because I didn't actually end up writing about this group because I didn't have space and time, and I couldn't justify it. But in terms of that, not noticing what's in front of you, more than one of these history books, sort of. Uh, will you know, talk in, in, in a great rush about the kind of the problems of a religious oppression and so on, and we'll sort of say, you know, uh, you know and Rasputin appeared to have this kind of, uh, you know, the intensity of some of the ecstatic sects in Russia, and they were an important part of a kind of dissident ecosystem of alternative beliefs, including, for example, the Kleisty, uh, the group of people um, uh, who uh, cut off their own um, 
uh, scrotums and in some cases penises as a way of getting closer to God. Anyway, so moving on, and you're like, whoa, go back, go back and say the thing again about the Kleisty because what was that, you know? Um, and, and, and there were various points where the, these extraordinary asides, I couldn't necessarily go into a lot of detail, but I could, I could, I could give it a short paragraph, you know, I could, I, could, I could mention that there is this kind of succulence to these details, which is both historically specific and also um, provokes a kind of astonishment and a sense of awe. So in terms of your language, um, I'm glad we're talking about that. So when I read you, I usually need to have a dictionary very close at hand. Um, I remember learning the word chidness from Perdido Street Station 15 years ago, for example. Um, and, I, you know, I always come across new to me, sometimes very elaborate Latinate words in very vivid vocabulary. Um, I will say... Um, I didn't need a dictionary for October as much, and I think what's clicking into place here is that the, all the Russian words maybe were standing in, in in that way. So you know the fact that you don't read Russian, but there is there are some Russian words and concepts you know in the Roman alphabet. Yeah. Um, I was hoping that you could just talk about your words and vocabulary, like how did it emerge in your writing? Um, is it just from years and years of wide reading? Did you have flashcards when you were 14? Um, and did you ever get, have you ever gotten pushback from editors when you invent words like the immer or um, just use words that aren't really in our general lexicon? Uh, editors, no. Readers, yes. Um, so, um, but I think that, that there's an interesting, that this crosses over at least two debates. One is the question of the, the language in fiction and one is in, in, in non-fiction. And obviously for me, I have had, for the most part, the luxury of not worrying too much about that. But it has been becoming more of an issue for me and for people who I work with recently. Just to, to, to quickly address what you're saying about the kind of language in the, in the fiction books, um, I, I no, I mean, I, I said, What's absolutely true is I, I like vocabulary, but I like, for example, specialist vocabulary. I like the, the, the poetry of specificity that you get with when you, whenever you talk to any uh, specialist in any field, the, the, the unique vocabularies that are thrown up um, are really intoxicating, and I like all that. So, for example, if I, you know, when I was writing, I, I think Iron Council, and there was a, it was Iron Council, and there was a section about uh, going through differing geography. So I, I kind of started looking at uh, geography terminology and it's incredibly beautiful. Um, I've never, I know some readers really don't like coming up against words they don't know and, and all I can say is as a reader I always really liked that and still do. So it's just if, if you don't like that kind of thing you probably won't like that kind of thing. Um, in the case of nonfiction, this is, this I think is a really live issue. It's interesting to me that you say um, you didn't have as many break moments. Um, there is a there is for me a, a kind of uh, really arid and tedious kind of um, moralized philistinism on the left about about prose, about form, and it's characterized particularly by the. Uh, and anyone who has been active on the left will recognize this, whether they agree with it or not, or who has read left literature. It's characterized very often by a kind of, uh, uh, a kind of smug recitation of Orwell's essay. You know, so if you, if you write anything which has you know, polysyllabic words that is in, an, in a political essay, someone will say to you, I don't know if you've read Orwell's Politics in the English Language, but maybe it's... A I mean, I think that essay is a really, I think it's a really, it's had a really baleful, deleterious impact on political <laughs> writing, in, in Anglophone political writing. Um, I think it's put forward, I mean, it's not the only, the only reason. There's also a lot of kind of, um, the, there's a lot of kind of moralism along this notion of like, you know, that you need to make things accessible. This, this chimera about accessibility. Uh, I mean, to be clear, if, if you're deliberately writing things which, you know, the aim is to be, you know, completely obscure, then that's probably not the best tone for a pamphlet. Okay, granted. But the idea that being playful with form is either inimical to a radical tradition or in some way, you know, off-putting to workers is the most patronizing bullshit. Um, and... You know, some of the people who I work with closely politically at the moment come from extremely working class backgrounds and the joy of discovering prose like 
Oscar Wilde and, you know, in his political writings, let's be clear, you know, or Baldwin or Angela Carter, you know, this is, this is a politicizing moment. So I'm not saying that the only way to write radical prose is to be Rococo. That would be ridiculous. But the interesting thing is our opponents feel no compunction at all about saying the opposite. You know, I had to go and look up a word. Your pamphlet has failed. You know, you had to look up a word. You learned a word. You're welcome. You know. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. perfect. <laughs> And the, and the disavowal of poetry of form, the disavowal, like you read Marx, read Capital Volume 1, the idea that this is not a man loving the sound of words coming out of his pen. You know, read Rosa Luxemburg, read, read the Junior's pamphlets, read that and tell me that part of the power of that as political analysis is not the rhythm and the cadence, excuse me, I'm not crying, that was literally just a moment of water, <laughs> and the cadence as well as the actual content of the, you know, it's just, it's, just, it's just a bogus bad politics as far as I'm concerned. I'm really sick of it. Great. So we are, um, we're going to turn to audience questions in a moment. Um, so I'm going to zoom past some other questions about the book and talk to you about Buffy for a minute. Um, so, you know, I, I didn't arrange this, <laughs> by the way. I didn't know. Um, so this year was the 20th anniversary of Buffy. I found an interview where you said, I remember when I was really hooked on Buffy, I remember having the, re the revelation that it, wasn't, um, that it wasn't that I wanted to know what would happen next, it was that I wanted to live in Sunnydale. And I was really troubled by that. Those are your words. So tell me about uh, who would you be in Sunnydale? Um, and you literally just glossed over the I was really troubled by that part well, of that. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's Trouble can, schmubble. Where would yeah, you live? we can go yeah, to that yeah. um, after you answer the first part. Um, and I'm wondering if you rewatched any Buffy episodes uh, for the 20th anniversary. What was the first question? Who would I be? Yeah. Well, so who would you be in Sunnydale? I mean, why do you, you want to be a Scooby? You want to be a Watcher? What's the What's the deal there? A techno pagan? I did not see this question coming. Um, <laughs> I really don't want to be someone who wanted, who wants to be something in Sunnydale. Um, I, even that, you know, and I say this as someone who loved the show, you know, and who loved, you know, if you want to ask me who my favorite character was, it was Anya. Um, but, um, please. Um, but, uh, I, I, I can't, I, I, I can't, I, I didn't relate in that, I mean, to me it was, it was more nebulous, it was, you know, when I started to realize that what I wanted was to have, you know, the front door that Buffy's mum had with the three windows that went down like that, you know, that then, that, that was when I started to be very troubled by my own relationship to, the, to that property and so on, so um, I, I am going to as graciously as possible duck the question because I, I didn't like where my own head was heading with it. I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense to me, and I mean, Southern California is lovely, so you know that makes a lot of sense. So my final question, because I'm also partial to Anya, um, season seven suggests that she was responsible for the 1905 revolution. Comments? She wasn't. Um, <laughs> no, no vengeance, Siemens in St. No, Petersburg. It was, uh, no, um, the, the the true events of the 1905 revolution are covered in the introduction of October, the story of the Russian Revolution. Um, so. Uh, I, no, I mean, what can I say? I like that kind of playing around. I like that, you know, they had Spike in the, 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 the so-called Boxer Rebellion. I like all that, but, um, um, but yeah. Thanks. But, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Great. Hi. Um, what are your thoughts on the current cankadort of contemporary U.S.-Russian relations? The current what, sorry? <laughs> cankadort. I thought oh. you'd like that. <laughs> I mean, I guess what I would say is, f from my perspective, having been following this as closely as, as, as I can, mostly from the UK, um, there is a certain kind of magical thinking going on, which is, look, uh, you know, I, I, I bow to no one in my disdain for Putin and his, you know, the excrescence of his state and the you know, chauvinist, nationalist, oppressive, capitalist, gangster capitalist, um, appurtenances that he has strengthened. Uh, I also bow to no one in my similar dislike of Trump. The notion that what happened was that the US was overtaken by a Russian coup is magical liberal thinking. That's not what went wrong. Uh, <laughs> and. It is, and when you see Keith Olbermann or whatever, you know, 
performing, you know, denouncing Russian scum on television, uh, you know, take our country back and so on. Um, it's, you know, at best, it's delusional. At worst, it's, um, it's an act of evasion and is therefore complicit with the political realities that he purports to dislike. Um, so, you know, by all means, let's excoriate Russia. By all means, let's excoriate um, the U.S. state. But let's not let let's be real about you know and, and all of this stuff about like you know, you know this, you know he's he's talking to the Russian foreign minister. This is treachery to the U.S. Treachery to the U.S. We, you know what are we talking about here? You know like the, 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 that should be what concerns me. This notion of like you know capital T treachery to some entity called the U.S. I I don't want to swear like this this sentimentalism about some mythic American state is and I would be just as rude and am about the British state. Let me be clear. And I have American citizenship as well as British citizenship, so I'm doubly rude in doubly in both directions. But the idea that like you know that that should be what we should be saving is American integrity. Is, is toxic, and it's not what got us here. So, you know, you want to talk about, you want to talk, you know, like, the, like, this is beautifully illustrated for me with the Podesta emails, beautifully illustrated with this thing. The number of people who, you know, people who wanted to vote for Hillary because they couldn't bear to vote for Trump, understood, you know, we can have a serious discussion about that. But people saying, you know, WikiLeaks, because they serve Putin, lost Hillary the election with that, with that dump, you know, those traitors. Like, no one is disputing. What, the, what that is actually saying is, oh no, someone revealed what our candidate was really like. Like, that's the substance of that. No one is actually saying that those weren't real emails. So you've got this candidate saying, you know, get a life to environmentalists, talking about cozying up to Wall Street and what wonderful work they do, talking about, you know, Bernie being a doofus, you know, all this kind of stuff. And you're not concerned about the substance of this. You're concerned about the fact that it was leaked, as if we couldn't know anyway. So that magical thinking, the outrage of that info, of that uh, data dump, rather than the outrage of the content of that data dump, is the most incredible symptom of, of, um, of political degradation for me. Hi, uh, thanks so much for coming. Um, I subscribe to your quarterly, Salvage, um, and it's, it's worth the international subscription. Um, and I, what I really like about it is that it's opened up space on the left for what you call playfulness and form. Um, you can write about left politics in a way that, that really has some, some fun with it. Um, but there's also a, a revolutionary pessimism that underlies that project that you've, you've written about a lot and you, you've talked about the, the current political uh, world kind of being informed by this politics of sadism. And I'm really intrigued by the idea of you delving into that while also simultaneously diving into the Russian Revolution and this brilliant, you know, carnivalesque bursting mm. year of 1917. And I'm, I'm curious to hear what that interplay was like for you. Thank you for that, that um, lovely question and advertisement. Um, just some context for people who don't know is that with, with um, several other people, um, uh, including um, our uh, editor-in-chief, Rosie Warren, we, a group of us set up a, a journal called Salvage, which, is, um, which, is, which we would be beyond delighted if people would subscribe. We're working on a shoestring. We have a print issue and we have a website, but the print issue is the center of gravity, salvage.zone. Um, and you're right, we try to be as open-minded as possible about form. We're not prescriptive about form, but we certainly try to move away from the kind of formalist moralism of, 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 of a lot of uh, left writing. Um, the question about pessimism is really interesting. One of the things that informed us when we were trying to create Salvage was the fact that, you know, that the political situation felt incredibly bad, incredibly bad internationally. It felt toxic, it felt terrifying, you know. And a couple of things follow from that. One is, um, <clears throat> oh, just, to, just uh, more context. Another thing that the left has traditionally been very moralist about is admitting that you think things are really bad because that's deemed to be in some way demoralizing. Now, as a matter of fact, I think that's completely fallacious. I feel more active and engaged 
in the last four years than I have for a long time, precisely because I no longer have to feel guilty about thinking things are really bad, you know, and, and, I, and I think there's something about that kind of unflinching eye. You can argue that it's wrong, you can argue that you're wrong to be pessimistic, but the idea that pessimism automatically leads to demoralization is straightforwardly bogus. It's just not true. Um, and I would actually say that radicalism and activism has lost more people to bogus optimism because you get burnt out, and then when things do go wrong, you are either surprised or you can't bear it, or in some cases, you're made to feel guilty because you know if all that was needed was one more push and it went wrong, then obviously you didn't push hard enough. So I, I think I, I would turn that on its head. One of the things that follows from optimism is not, at least for me, uh, the necessity of, that doesn't preclude, uh, from, pessimism doesn't preclude joy. It doesn't preclude, it doesn't even preclude optimism. What it precludes is starting from a position of optimism. If you start by trying to work out how to be optimistic about a political situation, um, then you're not actually analyzing what you're doing. That's essentially a kind of faith position. You know, it's a kind of left candide, you know, best of all possible worlds. Let's work out how we can, you know. Uh, in salvage, we, te we tease the worst aspects of the left on this with the, the hashtag, there are, there are great opportunities for the left in this because there's no situation about which someone will not say there are immense opportunities for the left in all this. And it's like, well, yeah, but there's also opportunities for fascists, and so far they've been taking them better than we have, and that's a problem, you know. Um, um, uh, the real headline, real headline from a real socialist paper in Britain uh, about a, 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 a convoy of activists going to the Calais refugee camp to hand out, I know people know there's a lot of refugees and migrant and asylum seekers in, in, in France, uh, Convoy to Calais halted by the authorities, but still a big success. <laughs> didn't leave Britain, didn't get to France, still a big success. Um, that's, that's not analysis. So I think for me, one of the great things about, uh, about trying to be serious about this moment, I don't, I don't start from pessimistic. I am, pe I, am, I am pessimistic because of what I see the situation at the moment. And at those moments when I think I'm either definitely wrong or there's a possibility for, being, for proving myself wrong, I am delighted. We have all hurled ourselves into the Corbyn phenomenon. You know, we're all deeply excited. But we have our criticisms and, we, and so on. But this is an unprecedented moment in British politics and it's great. I think the chances that it's going to win are very small. It's embattled, but that does not mean that I'm, I don't feel this great surge of, 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 of joy at the sh simple fact that he's shifted the agenda. Similarly with, with the Russian Revolution, like it is this incredibly, you know, again, for all the things that happen for everything, it's this incredibly inspiring moment, incredibly inspiring, like chokingly so. Um, and for me, I, I'm not suggesting that you would imply this wasn't the case, but there's not, not only is there no contradiction between being pessimistic about this, not this building, you know, <laughs> and, and that sense of, 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 of kind of catch in, in reading that, it is precisely this that makes it necessary to be this at this moment, the better to maybe get to that feeling again in the everyday. Does that make sense? Um, so I love fantasy fiction and speculative fiction, but I feel like it's been so rare for me to encounter uh, those kinds of things that deal with a progressive sort of humanistic political message. And Perdido Street Station was such a revelation for me in that way, along with some of your other writings. And I was just wondering if you could share some thoughts about the politics of fantasy and speculative fiction um, in, like, in the mainstream and where it is now and where you'd like to see it go. And I would encourage you to talk about New Paris, too, if you want, in that. <laughs> oh, New Paris is a little, the last days of New Paris is a little, um, thank you, is a little novella I just did. Um, you know, in some ways, I'm, I'm not good at answering this question because I get frustrated with the kind of, the, the, the gravitational pull of reductiveness in any discussion of literature and, 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 and politics. Um, um, and particularly because, in a way, I feel like we don't have the language to express what, what we want to express. So you use the word, and I'm not picking at you because we all use this word all the time, but you use the word like message, you know, what kind of message are you trying to... And I can't remember who it was at some writer, you know, um, you know if, if I want to send a message, I'll buy a stamp, you know. Um, it, it, it's like, uh, 
But there is, a, there is an important truth there, which is that in, in the fiction, it is, I think it is not, what I'm not trying to do is, is, is send a message, you know. Parenthetically, nor am I in October. October, the bulk of October, as I keep saying, narrative history. I, you know, some of my favorite narrative histories, I don't even know, let alone necessarily agree with the politics of the writer. The last chapter and some bits elsewhere, that, I mean, I, I don't want to disavow the politics at all, um, but I do want to say that its, it's, 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 it's first aim, if you like, is to tell the story, and then subsequent to that, there's space for me to, you know, develop my, um, a few sort of gestures towards analysis and politics and so on. I mean, so part of the reason I'm, I'm hesitant about this question of messaging is because, you know, the examples I always think of, you know, take, take, take Kafka, you know. Do, do we think Kafka is not a political writer? You know, do we think, you know, uh, I don't think that at all. I think he's a deeply political writer, but I would, I would find it very hard to extract a kind of simple meaning from anything he writes. Take modernist poetry, take, you know, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of, you know, uh, um, take Caitlin Doherty, who we've published in Salvage, take J.H. Prynne, you know, are these political poems? I think they're deeply political, but particularly in the case of Prynne, you know, you're going to have to do some hard digging and some tendentious arguing to say, well, this is the message he wants to get across. You know what I mean? Um, so in a way, one thing I want to do is expand the notion of what, of the way, because as much of this is to do with a politi political reading as it is to do with, quote, political fiction, you know, and I want to expand the, the I, I want to have a more expansive idea of what comprises politics in literature. Um, it's also worth remembering that one of the problems with approaching fiction as like uh, a kind of political catechism is that there's nothing, again, I don't mean to imply you're saying this, but this is the telos of some of these arguments. There's nothing to stop, um, you know, our enemies reading it. Plenty of despots have had wonderful taste in fiction. Borges was hard right. You know, it, it simply doesn't follow. It's a lovely idea that clever, sophisticated, powerful, inflected, you know, uh, fiction is in some way, you know, uh, sort of progressive or whatever. It's, it's flatly false. Um, you know, you can't, you can't derive that. Um, and plenty of, conversely, for example, Lenin, terrible taste in art, awful. Uh, um, really kind of borderline kitsch at places. Um, and, and he was very clear about the distinction. So, you know, when he talked about, you know, he talks about a Mayakovsky poem. I like Mayakovsky, um, uh, kind of experimental, but, and he says, and, and, My, and, and Mayakovsky wrote a kind of a poem about Bolsheviks having endless meetings and being unhelpful because they're just constantly having meetings. And Lenin says, I can't speak to the poetry, but the politics is absolutely correct. So that he, he, he just, in passing, makes it clear that you, you can't judge the, the two in this kind of simple facile way, which is a lesson it would be good to remind all the culture editors of all the left-wing journals currently in the, um, you know, in the English-speaking world. So those are a kind of set of really important caveats that I think are absolutely key to kind of establishing the ground on which I then want to say, sure, I would love to see fiction that is, you know, open to more, uh, that is more representational. I think the kind of expansion of uh, characters um, and indeed writers, more importantly, of colour, um, you know, um, trans writers, um, queer writers, and so on, and, and kind of bringing these sensibilities into the texture. And so on. I think this is a wonderful thing, of course, absolutely. Um, and I also think that, if you like, the slightly more increasingly self-conscious awareness of the inevitably political um, texture of fiction is, is a good thing. I have no problem with that at all. Um, I just want, I wanted to establish all those gloomy caveats first because I think that's actually quite a constrained field of celebration. Is it a good thing that, you know, the field of science fiction, for example, is opening up and that it's, you know, more various than it's been for years and years and years? Uh, absolutely, it is a wonderful thing. Um, uh, but, but, but all that other stuff I said, you know, <laughs> does that? Uh, so congratulations on winning the Rail C Young Adults in Russia. You're oh. extremely popular. And the question that I have is, apparently you're very aware of all the Russian writers. 
even the poetry. Who's your favorite? My favorite Russian writer. Um, Chlebnikov. Uh, Velimir Chlebnikov, the king of time. Uh, because he's less of a modernist and more of an eccentric visionary. And much as I love modernism, there is something about the sense of him as being a writer outside of time, again, out of joint with everyone else, that I find endlessly fascinating. So Klebnikov's aperçu and writings I find um, deeply inspirational. They've provided me with the epigraph of, at least, of one of my books, and, and I return to them a lot. Thanks so much, China Mabel. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank, Thank you for coming. Thank you.